Section 8.2 is called Series, and we will actually spend the rest of Chapter 8 talking about series, but this is our introduction to them. So, definition. A series is the sum of a sequence. So, for instance, if I have a sequence, a n, so it has the terms a1, the first term, a2, the second term, and so forth. This is what we worked with in the last section. Then the corresponding series is just the addition of these terms. So it would be A1 plus A2 plus A3, etc. Of course, I'm going to use sigma notation to condense this writing. This is the same thing as summation sign. I'm starting with the first term. I'm going up to an infinite number of terms of the sequence a n. So the sequence is the listing of the term. The series is the addition of those terms. Okay. Now, your textbook will talk about partial sum sums, which is when my summation sign goes from 1 up to n, some particular value. And you can actually do a lot of the proofs in this chapter using partial sums. I just want to give us a brief introduction into some of the very common series we'll be working with and a few of the tests that we can use on them. So in this section, we're going to have two really nice series, uh, the geometric series, and then also, which you will talk about in class, the telescoping series. These are the two types of series that actually tell me what the series converge to. I'm going to open with the geometric series. So you have a geometric series if you have something that can be written in this form. So I have a summation. It's going from 1 up to infinity of some constant times something being raised to the n minus 1 power. Now, granted, when you get a series, it may not look like this. But if you can manipulate it to this form, you have a geometric series. What's really nice? If you can get something in this form, the part that's being raised to the n minus 1 power is called the common ratio. And if I look at the absolute value of that common ratio, ratio and I see that it's less than 1, then I'm guaranteed that the series converges. And not only does it converge, I know that it converges to a over 1 minus r. So this is the really nice part. It tells me it converges and what it converges to. If the absolute value of that common ratio is greater than or equal to 1, the series diverges. Let's look at a few examples of these. So example 1, find the first term of the series, the common ratio r, and determine if each series converges or diverges. If it converges, then I want to know what does it converge to. In our first example, A, I have the series going from 1 to infinity of 3 divided by 8 to the n power. Now, we can talk about the first term now or later, but let's go ahead and look at it in this example. So the first term, well, the summation starts at 1. So what does our A1 look like? It is just the inside expression with a 1 plugged in for n. So notice I would have 3 over 8 to the first power. I'm just getting that 3 eighths, the first term. Okay. And now I want to talk about what is the common ratio r. So the trick is I want to get what I'm given here as this series to be in this form. So I like to talk about anything be raised to the nth power, and I want to separate it from the rest of the series. So first thing I'm going to do, I'm going to write this as a summation. It is going from 1 up to infinity, like I want, of 3 times 1 over 8 to the n. I like to get anything raised to the nth power or a power of n together, but yet away from any constants. Well, what I'm looking at is the summation. It's going from 1 up to infinity of 3 times. Notice that 1 over 8 to the n is the same thing as 1 over 8 all to the nth power. So this is a trick that you'll see a good bit, right? So 1 to the nth is 1, 8 to the n is my 8 nths there in the denominator. Continuing to manipulate what I'm given, I have summation going from 1 to an infinity 3 times. 
Notice this piece is being raised to the nth power, but I need something raised to the n minus 1 power. So the trick is that I'm going to peel off any of these I don't need. If I have n and I want n minus 1, that means I have 1 extra of the 1 eighth. So I peel it off out front. That's going to leave me with n minus 1 of them. If you think about your power rules or your exponent rules, here I have something raised to the first power, something raised to the n minus 1. Bases are the same. I add those. It does, in fact, equal my nth power. So what I'm looking at, summation is going from 1 to infinity of 3 times 1 eighth, 3 eighths, times 1 over 8 to the n minus 1 power. I now have the form I want, so I get everything else for free. The a in their formula is the constant piece sitting out front, the 3 eighths. That should look very familiar. It is actually that first term we found. The r is what's being raised to the n minus 1 power, so our r is 1 eighth. To decide if this converges or diverges, I'm going to look at the absolute value of r. So I'm looking at the absolute value of 1 eighth, which is 1 eighth, and I want to compare that to 1. Notice that this is less than 1. So this geometric series converges. And not only does it converge, it converges to a over 1 minus r. We're going to plug in our a and r to get this value. Our a is 3 eighths. Our r was 1 eighth. So I'm looking at 3 eighths divided by 1 minus 1 eighth is 7 eighths. Obviously a fraction inside of a fraction. This is the same as your first fraction times. I flip the bottom fraction. You should notice the eighths cancel. So our answer for this part is that it converges to 3 over 7. I have my first term. I have the common ratio. The series converges, and it converges to 3 7. Part B. Now I have a series that's going from 1 up to infinity of 4 to the nth power divided by 3 to the n plus 1 power. So first thing I do is I'll check my summation symbol. It is going from 1 up to infinity. So now I'm ready to look at the inside piece. I would notice that everything inside is being raised to some type of nth power. So I'm going to use that same trick we used up above to peel off any pieces I don't need. I have my summation symbol going from 1 up to infinity. Here I have 4 to the n, but I like powers of n minus 1. So I'm going to peel off one of those 4s. That is the same as 4 times 4 to the n minus 1. In the denominator, here I have 3 to the n plus 1. Notice that's 2 more than n minus 1, so I peel off those 2 extra 3s. So I have 3 squared times 3 to the n minus 1. Again, if you add those powers, 2 plus n minus 1, you have that n plus 1. So we did it correctly. So what I have now, summation going from 1 up to infinity. Notice out front, I have the constant 4 divided by 3 squared, which is 9. Here I have something being raised to the same power, so I can combine that into a 4 thirds to the n minus 1 power. I have the form that I want, which means I'm looking at a constant out front is 4 ninths. Common ratio is what's being raised to the n minus 1 power. And if I want to talk about does this series converge or diverge, I look at the absolute value of r, which is the absolute value of 4 thirds, which is 4 thirds. I compare that to 1. Notice this is greater than 1. So in this case, we have part 2 here. The series diverges. We have already written our first term. Maybe you realize it, maybe you don't. You can always talk about what is a1 at any point, right? These things are equal. So let's look at it in this one because I think this is always the easiest way to see this. a1, when I plug in n equals 1, you have this raised to the 0 power, meaning you are just getting a. We found that first term right here. It is that constant out front. It's because of how the geometric series is formed. So moving on into a couple other theorems that you're going to talk about in 8.2.
Uh, I mentioned the, the next three ideas, a couple are theorems, a couple are tests, just because students tend to get these confused a good bit. So one theorem your textbook talks about is if I know the series is convergent, then the sequence limit as n goes to infinity equals zero. So if the series is convergent, then the limit of the sequence equals zero. I think the reason these ideas are so easy to confuse is you have to focus on am I talking about the series or am I talking about the sequence. They are related, but they are definitely not the same thing. The series is the summation of the sequence. So we saw an example earlier where this was true. Uh, in our very first example in this section, what do we have? Sum going from 1 up to infinity of 3 over 8 to the n. We said this was geometric. We found that it converged. We found what it converged to. Notice if you look at the sequence, the sequence a n would be this 3 over 8 to the n. And you talk about the limit as n goes to infinity of this. Well, as your power on 8 goes to infinity, this denominator is getting larger, 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 meaning that fraction as a whole is going to 0. So this is just an example where you can see that that theorem did hold in this case. Now, we want to know, is the converse of this theorem true? So if I know the limit of the sequence is 0, do I get to say the series is convergent? And the answer to that is no. The converse of this theorem does not hold. And I want to give us an example where it doesn't hold. So I'm going to do that by introducing the harmonic series. Now, I'm not going to give a proof right now of why the harmonic series diverges. You can give that proof with partial sums. You could even learn some techniques in the upcoming sections to show that this diverges. Right? And I actually do that in class for my students. The harmonic series is the summation from 1 to infinity of 1 over n. And I'm just telling you for now that this series does diverge. You will see this series in a lot of different classes, uh, physics classes, engineering classes. So this is a series that diverges. However, if you look at the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence, so I'm talking about the limit as n goes to infinity of the n side of the series, the 1 over n. Notice the limit here as the denominator gets larger, larger, the fraction goes to 0. So this is your example of a sequence where the limit goes to 0, but the sum does not converge. So this is almost your counterexample, or it is your counterexample for why the converse of this theorem is not true. Now, because the harmonic series does appear so much, I want to go ahead and run through a quick example with it. So example three, you can tell I moved these. How about we call it example two? Determine if the series diverges or converges. So here I have a summation going from one up to infinity of 14 divided by nine times n. Now, properties of summations in our sigma notation that we're used to, you should realize, of course, that the 14 divided by 9, that is not affected by n, so I can pull it out in front of the summation. So if I pull out the constant, 14 over 9, I'm left with summation. n is going from 1 up to infinity of 1. Notice n was in my denominator. This is our harmonic series you know that it diverges. I have a constant times something that diverges, meaning this whole series diverges. Knowing that fact about the harmonic series makes it really nice, easy, and quick to work with some of the other summations and series. A major test that we want to talk about in this section, and it sort of follows the theorem up above. If you have a sequence and you can show that the sequence, right, not the series, if you show the sequence does not converge to zero, so the sequence does not converge to zero, then you get to say that the series 
diverges. So it really follows from the theorem we had up above, and it's called the divergence test. It's a really quick, easy way to work with the sequence but get to say something about the series. So example three. Determine if the series diverges or converges. Here I have a summation. It's going from 1 up to infinity of n squared plus 4 divided by 5n squared plus 7. Now as notice they're asking me if the series does something. Well, because the test for divergence is so quick, it's one that I like to use first in most cases, it says that I don't look at the series, I look at the sequence inside. And I want to take the limit as n goes to infinity of the sequence. So for us, this is the limit as n goes to infinity of n squared plus 4 over 5n squared plus 7. And what's really nice is this is what we spent section 8.1 learning how to deal with. So you know I'm going to look at the highest power of n in the denominator, and I'm going to divide every single term by that power of n. So I have my limit out front. Here I would have n squared over n squared plus 4 over n squared divided by 5n squared over n squared plus 7 over n squared. If you're looking at the limit as n goes to infinity, from my first piece I just have 1. This fraction is of course going to go to 0 as that denominator goes to infinity. Here I have a 5 in the denominator. Again, this fraction, it also has a denominator going to infinity, so as a whole it is going to zero. So you should notice that the sequence converges to one-fifth. Now, what does that tell me about my series? Well, the test for divergence says I want to take the limit, and I want to know, does this equal zero? The limit of the sequence does not equal zero, so what do you get to say about the series? You get to say the series diverges. So let me emphasize the series, summation going from 1 up to infinity, n squared plus 4 divided by 5n squared plus 7 diverges, and I like to say how I know that, it diverges by the divergence test. You can expect my students, if you're taking a class with me and some of the other professors as well, you will, on the free response, have to tell me how do you know something diverges or converges, what test did you use, and then you will have to display that you appropriately check the test.